wholeness to everyone, and thank you for allowing me to participate in this Flat Earth panel. It's uh, quite an amazing time. I got a chance to get in last night and give some brief information, but today I'm definitely ready to present uh, some information about the condition of Earth, where we are, what it's shaped like, the dimensions, et cetera, to hopefully give more clarity on the subject. And I first want to say, you know, giving big thanks to the Lightning in a Bottle team for making this all possible, Dream Rockwell, the sound guys, and all the people who put this together, the generators, the producers, the capacitors, and all the different components that are necessary for something of this magnitude to be possible. So I want to give thanks for that and let you know that this is extremely special to me in order to be a part of such a major event. Uh, just a, a brief bio, only a couple minutes, because I do have about a 20 minute runtime on my presentation. And I just wanted to say that, you know, the reason why I can speak on these topics is because I've been studying spirituality ever since I was five years old and having a multiple level of experiences, not only just in that realm of spirituality, but also in the world. And it has brought me to a point of being somewhat of a connoisseur of spiritual knowledge. And I do, of course, share that knowledge with others through the platform that I have, which is uh, AstroQuest, The Resistance, and currently open source spirituality, and that is Secret Energy for those who are uh, wondering you know, exactly where we're at and where we're producing information. I also wrote a book called The Code to the Matrix, which gives a deeper insight on language and everything that's going on in the reality, especially based on religion, external deities, etc. And so just getting right into this, what I really want to talk about first is, is that um, I wanted to first say thank you to the seekers of truth and the givers of truth. We're all looking to penetrate this chasm of deep knowledge and get some kind of clarity as to what exactly is going on on our planetary system, how we can make things better, and also how we can continue to develop our souls. And that is primary. So the more of us that are sharing the knowledge and information, bouncing it back and forth, and coming into more of a realization of what's going on, the better. So today's message, I do have some illustrations to show, and I'm just going to jump right into this in respect of time. And I really want to say first that the dimensions and the shape of Earth are what we determine it is. We have to be very clear about where we're exactly at and what's happening and what's happened over time, but there is an infinite vault, meaning an infinite amount of space above us, and there is also an infinite abyss or space below us. And what we're doing is we're actually filling that space. We fill that space with our energy, our concepts, even our constructs, and we often have to see that our expansion moves in all directions. So when someone says that they're ascending, in equal measure, they're also descending and they're also moving left and right. So ascension in itself is something that grows out into this direction because you're expanding, and that's something that's well understood about our spiritual vehicle. So the image that I'm showing you here is actually a rather, there are two rather ancient images from two spectrums of the cultures that are presiding here on Earth. And the reason why I'm showing this image is so that you can see that it's all encompassing the idea of where our origins are when we enter into physicality. And one picture, which you'll see is much more archaic, it's Sumerian picture of what we would say is Tiamat, also known as Leviathan, also known as Behemoth, also known as the mother of monsters. And that's because the birth of the entities that came forth from her were known to be chimeric or actually containing more than one type of being or characteristic. And these now come out to us as the zodiac signs. It comes out to us as even gods or deities that sometimes request to be worshiped. It comes out to us as archons, but their origins were with the mother and our origins are with the mother. So that's an important thing to remember. You're also seeing a, a rather old statue, statue of Gaelic tradition of the same kind of image of a mother that is clearly aquatic and from the ocean and known as also the aquatic or mother goddess. And the reason why I find this so important to start from this standpoint is because if you don't know where you come from, 
then you don't know where you're going. That's how all plants and that's how all things grow. They must recall first where they came from and then they know where they're going. The seed of anything always contains the whole. So there's absolutely no way we can begin to determine what the size, shape, and form of earth may be without first having the knowledge of exactly where we came from. And as that knowledge continues, you'll see it pass across traditions. This is actually another elder tradition in Kemet. This is uh, Mayat. And this is the actual emission of the planet, what's on the planet. So once again, you see what's being depicted is a womb and everything being encompassed inside of that womb. So the first thing that I would really like to bring forth for all of us to understand is that we are, in, we are inside of something and on top of something that is very much alive. We talk about it all the time, Mother Earth. We see trees grow out of it. We sustain ourselves from it. But often it skips our consciousness that this is actually alive and it is a living being. And in many cases, when you study the ancient traditions, which I've not only studied, but also been able to journey through my projections of the astral eye and also through my chakra centers, you'll begin to witness an archaic connection with this mother goddess, which is actually what we're on. Now, I would like to first introduce something that is often skipped within the presentations about the goddess. And we'll run this picture back one more time. And that's, we refer to it as a goddess because primarily it's feminine, but it does have a masculine component. Even men have a feminine component. We have a positive, a negative, and a neutral side to our body. And in physicality, we only appear as what we're partial to the most. So if you're partial to one pole, you'll come out as male. You're partial to another pole, you'll come out as female. And if you ever come in completely balanced, you'll actually come into the reality as a hermaphrodite, which we actually don't see that much anymore because there's a 23.5 degree tilt on the earth that actually governs why most people use their right hand opposed to their left. So what you see here is you see also this birthing taking place because some may ask, well, how did this mother birth these children? And when you study this from an archaic level, even the Parthenon, you see that women, as we would call them, could become pregnant without the actual external male component. That's also referred to as parthenogenesis. You can look it up. It's mainly present within the reptilian species. And this is also why you see that the mother has the termination of reptilian legs, or which could be considered as scales or fish legs. And for anybody that's thinking about it, yes, this is also what's now come to us as the Starbucks symbol. Now, this image here is actually showing you across time how the image of the mother goddess has actually morphed through time from indigenous cultures. And if you notice the chart to the top left, you'll see that the symbol in itself is that of an anchor. That our modern anchor and the shape of that anchor is actually modeled after the goddess. And the reason is the mother goddess or the mothership. And the reason is, is because this mothership is actually anchoring us in this vault or this abyss. And this is important to remember because for all beings in the physicality, you actually need something firm to stand on. You need roots in order to be able to grow up. So the mother goddess has always provided those roots and we're still on that ship now. And that ship is organic and it is alive. You'll also notice to when you start seeing the topographical instance of the earth that in a nutshell that all the bodies as we're calling them because in archaic form they are literally bodies and it baffles our consciousness to how a body could be that large but when you start moving up through the frequencies and you move out of the density of the physical reality and then you cancel time you actually can see the earth moving and breathing as a life form and even when you go into different places, you'll also see the varying characteristics of these life forms. But just to take it as it is, the life forms are in themselves em emerging from the deep or emerging from the water. And we're standing on top of those life forms. So before we can even go further, though, we have to dig a little bit deeper into our origins. And our origins are, in fact, from the ocean. And this is why... You often see in occult terminology, there's a reference to the Holy Sea. 
There's a reference to Mary, which means the ocean, which comes out in Christianity and many traditions as the goddess. And then you also witness things like these images, which are George Haeckel's Radiolaria. And in these images, what you begin to see is you begin to see the, not only the origins of life from its minute scale, but also to its magnitude, because the geometry is fractal. So this means that much of what, if not all, of what has been introduced into this world today is actually been pulled from the ocean. And that comes in the state of our subconscious. It comes in the state of our inventions. It comes in the state of our occultism. It comes in the state of our symbolism. So it actually is embodied within everything that is presented to us in the world today. So why one may say there's nothing new under the sun, which is more of a male reference, as sun means male, there's actually the deep that one would need to research in order to get deeper into the knowledge about where we are and what's going on in the planetary system. So as you can see here, when you begin to really study the albums of George Haeckel's work, you actually find entire shells that contain what we would call a heart, what we would call a spleen, and what we would call a liver and the parts of the human body. But we're talking about a span of over millions of years of the process of the existence of this planetary system. So I wanted to let everyone know now this is not an illusionary world. If it's an illusionary world to you, you would have to question how fake you are. This world is very real and it also requires us to do some digging deep and also to use our extra senses in order to divine exactly what's happening here and what's gone on throughout the timeline. But this is a simple example of what you're seeing here is actually the helmets or what appear to be the helmets of the Mongolians, but these are pulled from the sea. And it's just one example, I have several of them that I won't be able to show today, but one example of how our subconscious mind will pull a shape or an image of something from a primordial time and then come out with that as if we've invented it or we use it as if it's something that we need to, to have as a part of our embodiment and a part of our protection. Here's also two maps that have been redone but come from much more ancient maps of what the world looked like before the continents begin to divide. But the main characteristic that I want you to notice here is that everything is coming out of the water and surrounded by the water. So in the flatter theory of the ice wall, the ice wall is actually an endless expanse of water that we're actually emerging from. And also to quell the conflicts that go on about space, the ocean to the indigenous were known, was known to be space. The space is actually a reflection of what's in the ocean and what's on top of the emerging bodies of water coming out of the ocean. The only thing that you're seeing in the sky as far as those lights is you're seeing the spirits of the individuals that are still in the ocean or on land. And that's why in most occult knowledge they say that there's a star in the sky that actually belongs to you. That is true. And many of the larger celestial bodies, the ones that we can see and we can recall as planets, are actually still in our ocean and you're seeing the reflection of their spirit, which you could call bioluminescence. In addition to that, to also quell somewhat of the debates about if it's flat or not, we have to understand that even the top flat earth theorists did not actually use the term flat as a meaning of it actually being flat. That was just more of a catchphrase that kind of caught on for someone was, that was kind of discriminating against the whole theory that the earth was actually alive and actually a womb and a plane that we were walking on because in every tense it's actually not flat. You can see many mountainous regions and valleys and also structures that embed themselves so deep into the mantle of these bodies that it would be kind of logical that you could eventually circumference the entire thing, but it would not be an orb. And I think that that's what the biggest arguments are about is that Earth is not a sphere, which it is not. It is more of a craterous bowl-like chasm. Now we're gonna move a little bit forward here, again, in respect of time, in order to come to a total realization of exactly where we are. And as I said earlier, much of what our Earth turns into from a geometric level is based on the collective, meaning if the masses believe that Earth is X, then Earth becomes X. That's called a morphogenic field. It's actually when the consciousness 
of the species on the planet begin to determine the size and the shape of the planet. Now, when we go back into the ancient traditions, we'll find that, especially when you study some of the occultism and esoteric knowledge, that most of these societies that are putting forth the idea of a new world or a new world order are actually practicing a Babylonian tradition or a Sumerian tradition versus a Kemetan tradition. So it becomes very important for us to look at and attend the Babylonian and the Sumerian concepts of what the world is actually looking like because that has been embedded into the consciousness of everyone. So that's actually the reality that most people are living in until they choose to rise off the plane that they're on. So a big part of this, though, that I wanted to mention is that the reason why flat earth becomes so life-changing for many people is because it challenges the very construct in which you're walking on, the foundation. And once a person begins to be somewhat unsure about their foundation, then they become, they, they gain the ability to begin to, how can I put it, they gain the ability to begin to restructure everything. And this is sometimes referred to as the destroyer. So now the foundation is destroyed. You don't believe even the earth that you're standing on is the shape that they depict it as. And this is perfect for starting to unseat many of the concepts such as external gods and uh, vaccinations and all those things. So we could see that the flat earth theory has actually been rather instrumental to many people in their expansion. So there's no argument about that. The next step of this, however, is to go back into the ancient knowledge in order to realize what exactly is going on. Now, what you see to what I believe would be the left of your screen, which looks like a, a dome that's cut in half in a pyramid, a ziggurat, rising from sea level all the way up seven steps, okay? And then if you notice, there is an inverted pyramid below that descending into the underworld and that is actually referred to as the underworld. So according to Babylonian the theology and spiritualism, which again, we're still living in now, that the world was divided into seven planes. This is also why we have seven days of the week, seven primary planets or six primary planets, a moon, et cetera, because each of these planes actually represent a state of consciousness. These are the arcs or the archons that we're choosing to use to develop the most sentient life forms on the planet or could be perceived as the sentient life forms on the planet because one of the major things that you read about in the Sumerian and Babylonian literature is that they're actually attempting to civilize and tame Earth. And in fact, it appears that there was a great conflict between the mother goddess and the Sumerian traditions which are actually written in the Sumerian texts where Earth, as we know it, was actually disabled and parts of that earth were used as the bodies that we're standing on now. Now again, you would need to go deep into your theism and occultism and your esoteric knowledge and your meditations in order to divine this type of information. But the next thing that you'll start to realize is, is that if it's true, you will have a blueprint, meaning you will have a correspondence to what is supposed to be true because it will redundify everywhere in the status of as above, so below. So what you're looking at here also in the middle is the spectrum. This is what we would call the rainbow bridge. This is what we would call the races of people or the different types of people in the world, including the animals. And as you see that there are concentric lines, just like that, the Isles of Atlantis, concentric lines that actually mark the barriers between one existence and another. The truth is, is that what creates the buffer between one realm and another is actually the marriages that take place between those two, in this case, colors. But you do have a clear demarcation between one dimension and another. And for anyone who's gone through a massive spiritual experience, you'll find that you kind of raise off of earth or the earth plane. You lose this body, per se, but you gain a, the use of another body that is also shrouded around you, that is made of a lesser, denser, less denser form, and then you're able to go through other spaces. So that's actually what you're seeing all the way on the right is a diagram that was put together about how those concentric circles determine the development of the spheres that are around your body and which we call the aura. In addition to that, you can see that the Babylonian or Sumerian concept was still the same as the earth and the ocean being a reflection of the cosmos. 
you're seeing that in the picture off to the right to where below there's actually the seven aisles of the Sumerians, which again gives us the seven gods, seven days of the week, etc. And then you're seeing the mirror or the reflection or the correspondence being mimicked in the heavens, which again gives us the term as above, so below, in the heavens, also on earth. But another thing that I want you to see here, because this is going to start to solidify more and more that this is in fact going on and this is in fact true, is that if you notice that the base pillar of this ziggurat, which is also known as the black pillar, corresponds to Saturn in the Sumerian tradition. And the interesting thing that was discovered about Saturn, and we'll come back to this image later, but that the poles actually are of a hexagonal nature, and that's over there on the right. And that hexagon, of course, gives us the cube. So what you then can divine, if you're following along, is that this base pillar is also known as the cube. And this cube is in many tenses what the indigenous used to refer to when they would draw diagrams like this. This is, of course, the ancient oriental depiction of Earth and the cosmos all as one, not as separate. And then another depiction of oriental depiction of the Earth, again, as a square having four corners. And then again, we get here the Aztecs emulating the same four corners and then even the most popular image of the flat earth theory there being four corners. And this is somewhat of um, a metaphor that has been taken rather literal and needs to be blown up because in a two dimensional aspect, the earth would then be flat, but in a three dimensional aspect, then it would be a cube. And that's what's referred to in society as the societies as the square and standing on the square. And also the four elements that are around the tips of the square are actually known as the four elements. And those elements were used in order to create the actual forces that you're seeing on the earth. So now images such as this, which is the Hindu mythological representation of the world, make more sense because this tortoise, which actually when you dig deep, they'll tell you is the female, is actually a correspondence to the parthenogenic mother goddess. The four elements, which would then be elephants, are then interpreted holding the bowl or the concave shaped earth. So now you can fully interpret that symbol. So the thing is, is that with ancient mythology, you actually need to have the experience and you need to have the scope of understanding in order to be able to interpret the symbols or it seems quite fanciful that the earth could be on the back of a turtle. And it's just because our terminology that we use to explain things is very different than the ancient terminology. Now, here's another image that I showed earlier that's also very important because it gives you more of an idea of what actually exists in the realm slightly above us, even higher and then higher, and then how all those realms merge together. Because in the patterns or the orbits of the planetary systems, what you actually get is the tracing of the stars. And that's why the name of the mother goddess has also been known as a star. And the reason is, is because the orbits of these planetary systems actually begin to dictate the geometry that is placed within the chakras. So we go back here to this image again, and we begin to see that each step on this ziggurat in this particular Babylonian system does actually correspond to geometry. And how the Sumerians would put that is by numbers. Like Marduk was 50, there's 40, there's 30, there's 20. And these are to depict the levels of the chakra centers that are actually encrusted with inside of each realm. And now you'll see on Earth that we actually have, on the left you see the phi, which is, the left is the pattern that Venus traces out in the sky. Those are concave pentagrams, which are very different than straight line pentagrams when you understand geometry. But those concave pentagrams are actually what you witness in plant life, in phi, and in much of the mathematical encoding of the planetary system. And then you have five and six come together. So six is the base pillar. So when five and six come together, they make 11, which creates actually a dual plane. So what you're actually witnessing here is the terminology phi, which is phi, which is also fighting. It's also conflict because phi replicates itself based on conflict. And then you have six, which is also sex 
which is known to be what is taboo on the planet because it's the reproductive cycle. So when five and six get together, then there is a birth of what would be 11. So this is how the planetary systems, and we're just using soft numbers here, nothing's in stone, but this is how the planetary systems develop the, the life forms that live upon it and breed, cross, cross breed through marriages the unique life forms that we see around us now. So this, of course, is archaic. It takes place over millions of years. And obviously, the knowledge of this, as I spoke about yesterday, has already been uncovered by the royal societies and the Enlightenment era that took place over 180 years ago, in which the knowledge that was sequestered from that system, which, of course, were George, a part of it was George Haeckel's radiolaria, was locked away, away from the populace and used now to control them. So what you see is literally what you see. Things coming from the sea are concepts from the mother and then taken into the undivine masculine reality and then shaped and formed and fashioned in another way and then they come out as if they're the gods and the inventors of this and that it belongs to them, etc. when that's not true at all. Now we want to get into another topic about why the spheric aspect of the world is even being used now and it has a lot to do with this image and many have seen this before. You will witness a circle around the sun or a circle around the moon, depending upon how the light is set up and depending upon the stage of the celestial body. And so this is why there was an idea, a concept that there was actually a round sphere around Earth, because it is true to a certain extent, but that sphere does not have much density to it. You actually have one of these spheres or toruses also around your body. So it's, again, another metaphor that is taken out of context, but there's a big difference between a sphere and a circle. Now, remember, that's 2D versus 3D. So the, the 2D circle actually represents, as a symbol, a cycle or repetition. It's generally called the course, as there's courses in time. It also represents infinite rebirth and death. So that's why the circle symbolism is often used because it harkens to an enclosure or a place that we're confined within and then that there is a boundary. As you see on each of these systems, there's actually a boundary between each space and those boundaries are not to be crossed according to the governors of the system. Now these boundaries are also what we would say are the walls between the living and the afterlife or in flat earth terminology, we would call it the ice wall. But this could easily be crossed when using another vehicle that can actually get you into those spatials. Now, what I want you again to pay attention to is the center ring because there is um, a really concise concept that you can adapt in order to really understand what you're dealing with. And that's, this is in effect a disc and uh, I see that I'm running out of time, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and conclude here. Uh, the last thing is, is just to understand that if you accept someone else's concept of what your space is, then this is a, uh, uh, this is a diagram of the manifestation of uh, artificial reality, also known as the Adam Cadman, which is when you're fed ideas of what the reality is that you're on, and then those realities begin to embed and interact with inside of your consciousness, thus creating a, a new kind of temple that can be controlled by an external party. The origins are with the mother, and I urge those to study this more, to tune into what we have, secretenergy.com, if you would like for more information. And thank you for having me on once again. It's been an amazing time, and I'll be looking forward to my presentation tomorrow, which will be about symbolisms. <laughs>